you know, micro recycling science was something that uh, when I first, um, uh, I, I guess, was awarded my laureate fellowship, uh, I, it, it took a fair bit of time for me to actually kind of explain what I was on about. And I thought, uh, gosh, this is, this is something that's going to be harder than what I expected. Because I think it was, it was something where people said, what do you mean by micro recycling uh, science? So you'll see a little bit today. And hopefully, um, you know, I'll be able to do it in a lot quicker sort of time rather than taking many, many months to explain to people what micro recycling science means. And of course, more recently, we've been awarded uh, an ARC hub uh, for micro recycling of batteries and, and waste that comes out of batteries. Why is that so important? In a broader sense, um, I suppose, apart from the obvious things, right? I mean, we think about, uh, yes, it's good for the environment. Of course, you've got to think about the positive impact that recycling can do if you're diverting waste away from landfill. But there's also other very important issues. And the other important issue is, as we, as a society, whether it's about energy storage or whether it's about making new devices, you know, for, for people who need it, whether it's in the space of, you know, health and medicine and environment and all of these issues. I mean, life has become exciting through science and technology and application of technology in so many different ways that we actually depend upon our materials that allow us to create new devices and new systems. And can you imagine where we could, in fact, be in one tiny factory, not only recycling, making materials, making our devices, and putting that out into practical application? So there's yet another bigger vision that I think I've shared with everyone for the first time uh, ever with any audience, uh, that you know, we are thinking about micro factories being so much bigger than the initial vision of recycling waste and, and really looking at the materials in different types of end-of-life products and batteries is one example of how things are actually. So if you sort of stop, look at it and go, right, this is, this is difficult, the disposable batteries. I don't know if any of you have ever sort of had a battery open up and fall apart in front of you. And this is how the journey for me started personally. It was one of those things where you looked at this black mass and of course, in the industry, that's what they call it. You know, all the materials that are there in waste batteries is referred to as the black mass. You know, what do you do with that? How do you actually get it to the point where you don't have to just think about a traditional smelter in which you smelt ores and then create all the expensive elements and compounds that are there in, in your batteries back to life again? So imagine if you, ha if you could, in a tiny micro factory, not only take the materials, recycle it, reform it, and start to imagine a future where you're starting to embed them in various devices. And we're, we're starting that journey already. It's been exciting because we're actually seeing that not only have we made building products, and I'll show you some examples of that, but the journey of actually thinking about how we embed different types of expensive materials that are now no longer that expensive because we've made them out of recycled materials, but the fact that you can embed your sensors and monitor the health of buildings and monitor the gases and imagine all of these things making all of this in a local micro factory. So there's a challenge to, to all of us that can you, can you imagine that it's now no longer in the hands of just the few large companies that know how to make, for example, batteries and phones and electronic devices. So it is really that whole decentralization of, in fact, manufacturing and the way we produce our products for our everyday application. Imagine if we could do that starting with waste materials. And in the way that journey for our micro factories has come a long way, we, of course, are moving along very quickly in that space where in addition to actually producing the feedstock, whether they are metallic or whether they, they are, are indeed plastics or ceramics, we're now starting to actually produce the higher and higher value materials. And it's that ability to produce higher value materials is what will make it economically viable in the long term. Because of course, one of the things everyone says, well, you know, if it's a micro factory, surely it can't be economically viable, right? We have, because isn't, when we talk about <coughs> making something economically viable, we always talk about the fact that everything has to be bigger. Bigger because it's about economies of scale. So I guess from our point of view, the ability to actually think about how we can in fact start to produce these types of products is really where the micro factories are now starting to move into a whole new domain where 
Yes, we've made our plastic filaments, and I'll show you how we do that. And yes, we're working with manufacturers. So people said, well, really, is this going to ever be economically viable? Because that, because it's a bit too noisy. Sorry about that. Um, it is about a simple fact. If you think about prices of plastic filaments, and I wanted to say that up front, because I know a lot of people sort of you know, are baffled with the fact that if it is small, it will never achieve economies of scale. So how are you going to scale up? So I'm going to leave with you a couple of new ideas about what scale up and scalability also means in a business sense. Scalability doesn't always have to be bigger and bigger. It doesn't always have to mean achieving economies of scale. It can also be, as you'll see in some of the examples, it can also be about economies of purpose. So what we mean by economies of purpose is that if you could indeed produce materials that are highly valuable, and if you could do that on a small enough scale that you are absolutely meeting the needs of markets, then you know you've created something that doesn't always require us polluting the planet. Because think about what we do with traditional processes, right? Traditionally, if we've always thought about vertical integration, we mine something, we make a material, you know, first of all, it's mined somewhere far away. Then the materials are transported to some smelter somewhere far away. Metal's made or something. Then it's sent to some other long distances. Think about all of the movements of materials and how much energy is actually spent in making the products that we just take for granted, for instance. All these expensive, important elements, whether they're silicon or copper or rare earths, all that costs energy. So the reason why the bigger picture is important to think about is that it's about ultimately understanding how we're going to sustain our planet, where we're going to have a fair and equitable access to all of these types of systems and devices and learning aids and health solutions if the materials and the products get more and more expensive. Inequity is naturally going to come in. So to bring in equity, to be able to reduce the impact on our planet, to be able to reduce our energy consumption in making these expensive materials that are needed for our digital economy, that are needed for electrification, that is needed for all the simple, simple devices, again, referring to health and buildings and so on, all the elements and the materials that go into making these devices, imagine if you could do that in a decentralized manner in different parts of the world. And you didn't have to always transport materials all over the world just to simply produce one small material that can go into your local economy. So it is about thinking at a bigger picture level. How do you save on energy? Which means you don't always have to depend upon traditional ways in which we smelt materials. And that's really where, I guess, for me personally, the journey of manufacturing these materials begun because as, as a PhD student, when you work on these topics and you're sort of told, well, wait a minute, you know, coal is always the material of choice when it comes to making steel in a certain way, you know, but wait a minute, there are other ways in which you can bring in some of the resources. So likewise, now what's been really exciting as people have read and heard about a lot of these micro factories, for us, it's also interesting that even the traditional large mining corporates are suddenly getting excited about it. One of the large mining sectors that actually is committed to mining operations, because that's what their core business is about, is already starting to think, how can we actually make copper through micro factories? Now, it's interesting that they would have been the last company that I would have ever expected to ask us about micro factories and our ability to produce important elements like copper. So this is where, of course, for us, it's about recognizing that this whole kind of new future about making materials through micro factories, for instance, is not just about small companies, because you might think, right, OK, there are small companies. Those are the obvious ones, the SMEs, the councils, the community groups that can take it on because they are affordable. But also some of the larger traditional businesses looking at what the potential is. Because one key element that we all have to deal with is our waste material. So whether it's about copper coming from our electronic waste or copper coming from mining, there's one big difference that everyone agrees, that the amount of energy that it takes to mine a material and to convert that into metallic form and a manufactured product 
is a lot more from mining compared to if you were to recycle it. And aluminium is a classic example. Aluminium actually saves 95% energy if you were to recycle aluminium compared to mining bauxite and producing metallic aluminium. So there you go. I mean, that's the one key message in a lot of these materials. And I've given you one example. But imagine if the entire world's production could be done by tapping into these types of waste resources. So I want to start at the very, very basic level. Things have changed in Australia quite dramatically. And it started out when, of course, we all became aware that, you know, we thought we were recycling, we were putting in a lot of our materials into the yellow bin, but actually what we found out very quickly was, no, we were not doing recycling onshore in Australia. A lot of our materials were ending up overseas. And so this is really something that was covered um, by the Australian, and it just shows you examples um, of, you know, for instance, you look at the top left-hand corner there, you, you, you know, we all would absolutely be horrified if we found this in our backyard, right? And so... The question to ask is, why is it okay for it to be happening in places like Indonesia? So when we talk about equity and access to new technologies, we also have to remember that technologies have to do their job in an affordable manner. So sustainability must be affordable. Otherwise, how are we going to make it equitable for everyone to access sustainable technologies? So part of the reason why, of course, we are motivated to do this that better? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that, is we can see the, the cost of inaction, right? And in this particular instance, I wanted to be fair to both the major retailers uh, who we buy uh, groceries from. For those of you who may not be familiar, but the two big chains, Woolworths, that's the W there, and Coles on the other side, you know, got to be fair to both of them. Both of these businesses have found their names on food packaging that have ended up in this pile, right? So I guess what we are trying to say, it's not about you know, blaming or finger pointing, but rather it's about making the obvious case in point that this is all part and parcel of what life is. Food packaging is part of life. Yes, food packaging has been designed to extend the shelf life of products, which makes food more accessible to, to places and people that it wasn't before. But we can't afford to have plastic packaging again end up polluting um, countries across the world. So the, the solution for us in terms of thinking about micro factories is also around thinking about how this could well be deployed in different parts of the world. If we are going to have sustainability as affordable, we need to, of course, design systems that are small enough and they're able to be deployed. Now, of course, again, you might look at a pile like this and go, oh, wait a minute, you know, really? Who uses these? these old monitors anymore. Well, let me tell you, there are probably lots and lots of stockpiles of old monitors in different parts of the world that we, um, you know, as developed economies have probably disposed of with all good intentions to actually hope that this gets recycled. Uh, but, you know, maybe we need to think or call it wish cycling because really the real recycling is not happening. So we're just doing the right thing as citizens, as global citizens. We want to do the right thing. But of course, if it doesn't end up um, you know, being properly recycled, then that's what you see in different parts of the world. Why is this happening? Complicated as it is, people look at this plastic and go, oh my gosh, that's difficult plastic. That's not your normal water bottle. You know, It's not going to be recycled. That plastic is probably more valuable, more expensive to make in the first place. So why are we seeing this as a problem? We're seeing it as a problem because, of course, in this case, you can see that it doesn't just have the plastic casing, but it also has a glass monitor. So suddenly we're not talking about a simple water bottle. We're talking about two, three different types of materials. And imagine if inside you've got circuit boards, then you've also got metallic materials. So you can't just assume that you're going to set up a traditional recycling plant you know, put this at one end and out comes another monitor or a, a brand new computer monitor at the other end. It's not going to happen. So we have to recognize that when you've got a whole range of materials, complex mixtures of different types of materials, we need to actually have recycling being done at, at the level where we appreciate that what you might do to the glass and to the plastic could be quite different. In some instances, you might have to accept the fact that, you know, you can't nicely separate it out and therefore, you've got to look at the mixtures. 
So the ability to take mixtures of glass and plastics together means you're actually not even talking about traditional recycling. So, you know, you, you hear of things like the three R's, the reduce, reuse, recycle, as much as, yes, we do all the right things in designing, getting the products at the end of their life to the right place, but if you cannot properly separate out different types of materials, you're not going to be able to recycle them in a traditional manner, which means in some cases, we have to accept that there will always be a mixture of different types of materials. So how do you selectively produce these expensive polymers and glasses and metallics in these systems? And that's really part of what we call the fourth R, where we want to reform our materials. So in case where we've got plastics and glass, and we've done that and shown that successfully with automotive waste, where you've got in your cars lots of plastics, and of course you've got safety glass um, in, your, in your windows, so how do you recycle that? You know, someone who's recycling glass is simply going to shred the uh, in recycling cars. It's just going to shred it, get the steel out, send the steel away for recycling. Fantastic. About 75, 80% of the weight of a car, which is steel. What happens to the rest of the non-metallics, the plastics and glass? We've shown that you can mix the two in the form in which they are present, a complicated mixture, and create a whole new high-performing ceramic material out of it. So it's not going back to becoming that particular plastic or that particular glass, but it's actually going down a whole new pathway where we are actually reforming it and carrying out what we like to call the molecular transformation. So recycling and reforming being done at a molecular level. So again, more and more examples of stockpiles of these parts of uh, you know, electronic waste. So you can see in this particular instance with circuit boards, another classic example of how it's a complex mixture. The board itself is an epoxy, it's a polymer. The board is strengthened in many instances with glass fibers, so there's glass. The circuit board now has got copper on it, right? All the, all the circuitry that's present, copper and tin and so on and so forth. So you can't sit there and assume that any technology is going to simply nicely recycle all the different materials. In fact, sadly, in a lot of um, places, in developing countries in India and Africa and so on, what happens is that people who are actually left with dealing with this, because this is the only livelihood they know, are burning away a lot of plastics so that they can produce the metallics and use that um, as a way to generate income. So we know already that there are lots of bad practices that are going to harm, cause harm to people's health who are working in those areas. So therefore, we actually owe it to humanity to develop technologies that are going to be safe and sustainable. And this is really why it's important that we look at, you know, emerging products like e-waste. I mean, we would have never even thought about the quantities and the volumes. But of course, there is a positive side to it. Imagine if we could actually produce a lot of these metal alloys out of this, that would actually reduce our dependency on traditional mining-based technologies. And if we do that, then we'll reduce our consumption of energy. So it's back to that overall bigger picture. Why are we doing it? We're doing it because one, it has a huge impact on our environment and our people. But think about the benefits in the long term to people, to our ability to create new opportunities and new jobs. UNEP has clearly outlined, and there's lots and lots of information that actually talks about the billions of dollars worth of resources that are in fact embedded in these products. But of course, it's not as easy to get to these types of materials that I've been talking about. So it's important that we recognize that ultimately the bigger picture is always going to be with us. If anything, it's going to only keep getting more and more complicated because our, look at our phones, look at our systems. They're getting smaller and smaller. Our devices are becoming miniaturized. When you actually have got complex systems in small places, traditional recycling simply will not apply. And this is where, of course, we are changing the way micro factories are bringing a lot of these solutions to the world. So I picked up sort of in this video uh, two parts to it. One is, of course, a nice, neat, um, and of course, things falling off the back of the truck, like literally. So this is in Sydney, uh, one of our industry partners who does a lot of this recycling. Um, the partnership with, with them, of course, is great. But this is uh, a journey that we took to, to India a couple of years ago, um, and not too far from Delhi. Again, interesting to see that right there where waste is being collected, manufacturers, small-scale manufacturers sitting there and producing all kinds of simple things. So in that particular case, you saw a guy who manufactures 
little um, torch lights, right? So there's no reason why you can't imagine taking a lot of these types of end-of-life products, reforming it, bringing it back to life again, manufacturing products right there in that region. This, of course, represents Sydney, right? And the waste that we are collecting in Sydney. But again, in Sydney, as I was saying before, it's not as if all of this was being recycled onshore. So with this particular partner, we are now developing microfactory technologies and there they've got a prototype um, unit running in Sydney. But this is where you might say, well, this is all well and good. Really, are we ever going to achieve the right qualities? Remember when I was talking about micro-recycling? This is what we've been able to show, that you can actually create these alloys. Two examples here, tin-based alloy and copper-based alloy, all coming from this one resource, waste circuit boards. And we've done this in this particular instance, one of the microfactory technologies called thermal micronizing, where we've actually micronized those to be able to create clean, high-quality metallic alloy. Why is that important? One, of course, the science has shown that it can be done. So yes, proving that was an important first step, because how do you, how do you know the quality of the alloy and the material that you're making? How do you know all, its, all of its properties? That was important for us to be able to show that micro-recycling science actually can deliver the expected quality for different types of applications. The other question, of course, is now that you have that as a really, really good alternative feedstock to traditional mining, can you do it on a small enough scale? So part of what the micro factories are doing is taking it out of the lab now and looking at how the translation of that micro recycling science through micro factories can actually be delivered. So that's the next step for us. That's what micro factories are. And part of that thinking is taking us all the way through the journey of manufacturing. So in these cases, we know we can actually take a lot of these metallic particles and use 3D printing to manufacture different types of products. So whether you're doing 3D printing for plastics or for metallics or ceramics, it all can be done. The cost lies in the fact that all of these expensive feedstocks mean that only you know, some applications can afford it at the moment, right? So you think about all the expensive parts where you can pay a lot of money for titanium alloys and copper alloys and all of that, yes, you can afford to do that, pay a lot of money for these expensive metallic powders. But imagine if you could suddenly make it so that these types of metallic particles and powders could be made in an affordable manner, suddenly it opens up the possibility of manufacturing all those parts and components. And you could do that in the local region where you're actually accessing these types of metallic feedstock. So again, it's opening up a whole new realm of possibility. And that's where, of course, we are at with our micro factories. You can see through some of these um, studies that we've been doing that the transformation and starting with waste circuit boards, you can see the result on the right hand side there. But the video in the middle is actually showing you how these metallic particles are actually coming to life. Yes, we need to be able to control what happens to the metal and what happens to the non-metallic fraction. But this is exactly why you selectively create the different outputs. It's not just worrying about the metallic droplets, which you can see the shiny little tiny balls are indeed the metallic droplets. And we can do this transformation very quickly. So the nice thing about micro factories is we're able to control, as you see here, in a small enough scale, the time and the temperature. So you can control speeds and you can actually enable production to be a lot more flexible, which means you can say, right, I'll be running today at 500 degrees Celsius because I want to make a particular alloy. But on another day, I can actually control my process parameters so I can make a different type of alloy. So that's where, of course, micro factories can be quite agile and different to traditional smelters. Because as you can imagine, if you are a traditional smelter and you are operating at a fixed temperature and it's a massive furnace, you're not going to change temperatures. In fact, it takes far too long and economically not viable to say, right, today I'll operate at 1,200, tomorrow I'll do it at 500, and I'll make different alloys every, every week. It's absolutely not economically feasible. Whereas in a smaller micro factory, you can do that. This then brings us to the next question around materials like batteries. And remember, I was referring to all the black mass that comes out of our batteries. But then again, it's not that simple, because we know there are so many different types of batteries, you know, from the lithium ions to the disposable ones. You know, how many of us are sort of held the disposable ones in our hands and you're going, should I throw this in my red bin? Or is it recyclable? Should I take it to a recycling place? Does my local council offer recycling services? So all of these sort of challenges in society 
we are at the point where we know we're sitting on something that is challenging, but yet exciting because of the reasons that I've outlined above. You can see the prices of these materials. Again, very expensive, whether you're talking about things like, you know, you may not even have thought about zinc. Yes, but it is there in our batteries. You know, you may have, of course, heard about things like uh, lithium ion batteries, which of course contain significant amounts of cobalt. So why are we not looking at the possibility of taking these end of life batteries and reforming a lot of these expensive materials, because that then means you start to produce materials. And of course, let's face it, that's how we innovate, right? If you can see hope in being able to produce those materials right there locally, you can actually imagine creating your own systems and you can imagine creating your own devices. That's exactly what we're doing at UNSW. Our ability to say, right, okay, here's a piece of tile. We've made this tile. Now, can we embed some electronics in there or some sensor in there? So suddenly we're looking at this whole new exciting generation of the fact that these micro-modular systems and products can be so versatile. So, you know, I mean, one of my students was so excited the other day because I said to him, now start to sort of put some of that electronics on the surface. And, you know, he was sort of going, okay, now she's really gone crazy because this tile has got waste textiles in it, waste glass in it. This surface is nowhere near perfect. How am I actually going to sort of start to lay out some of that electronics and actually uh, make something that actually works, right? So what we actually discovered as part of that without getting into a lot of details, is that the way the surface had been created, because of those inbuilt imperfections, we were actually getting a better outcome. So here's, here's the, the thing that we constantly find time and time again, which challenges the notion that waste recycling always has to be something that delivers perfect outcomes, because some of those imperfections may be managed, may actually not be bad for the process, so our green steel process proved exactly that, that people thought, well, if you're using waste tires in the process of making steel and replacing some of the coal, that can't possibly work because, you know, there's all of that sulfur that's present in the tires. How are you actually going to deal with that sulfur? That's going to get into steel and that's going to ruin the quality of steel. But the way we found a way around that is by injecting at those high temperatures, the shredded rubber tires, not into the metal, but actually was going into a phase that was sitting above the metal. That allowed us to take advantage of some of the molecules that we were generating at those temperatures of steel making. So we showed that we could actually produce nice, clean hydrogen molecules out of that rubber because we literally did, as I was referring to earlier, that molecular recycling, releasing these small molecules and enabling that to participate in the process of making steel. So we got the good bits we wanted, we were able to capture the negative elements and we we're able to actually recycle those tires to the point where the amount of waste that we were generating from that was so minimal because ash, which is present in some impurities that are still present in the tires, could in fact be captured in the process. But guess what? Compared to coal, it wasn't just a one is to one conversion. It wasn't just the fact that we'd achieved similar sort of performance would actually achieve performance that was a lot better. Now, again, that is counterintuitive because you'd say, well, you know, if it's a waste tire, surely it can't do a good enough job. And so same thing now. We're looking at this complicated pile and going, now, surely this complicated mixture of black mass that contains all of these, these expensive elements, surely we cannot refine that to the extent that we want, right? Uh, but just think of it this way. Even the example of zinc that we've published recently in Nature Scientific Reports, and we've published that also um, with Nature Applied Science, what we've shown is that there's no reason why you cannot get outcomes that are equal to getting a lot of this zinc from mining. Guess what? I mean, when you mine materials out of the ground, it doesn't come out with some kind of super duper high purity, does it? I mean, it's got all kinds of contaminants attached to it. We just learned how to deal with it. But now we're looking at this complicated mixture and going, oh, but wait a minute. You know, I've got zinc and manganese together. I can't do it. In fact, you know, what we've shown is that not only were we able to do it, we were able to get to both of those elements. We wanted to get zinc in the form of zinc oxide. We want to get manganese in the form of manganese oxide. We're able to do that within the process. 
So this is what micro recycling is all about. It's about our ability to actually recognize what transformations can come in a way that we can selectively isolate these different types of elements. We're working on a project right now where we're taking basically hard drives. We all know hard drives. Everyone make, wants to make sure it's been destroyed for data security. We're taking hard drives that a company that processes end of life hard drives, taking magnets that are there in those hard drives, right? So this is all end of life products, magnets that are rich in rare earth. So we've shown that it is possible to actually create rare earth oxide from that hard drive and make it so that it is actually a viable business for this particular company that is only looking at processing hard drives. And of course, that was a no-brainer for this company because it was more like, well, actually, I'm already in a business of processing hard drives, dealing with end-of-life materials. I know I can give you all these hard drives. Now, if the micro factory processes allow me to actually get to some of these expensive oxides, that would actually enable me to have double wins. One, I could be in a manufacturing and supply chain. Two, I could offer to my customers a service that nobody else can offer. Imagine if you could tell your customers, no, no, that particular hard drive doesn't even exist anymore. It's been transformed at the molecular level. You never have to worry about the fact that your data is ever going to be hacked into or whatever, because guess what? Whether it's got metallics in it or whether it's got rare earths in it, I can actually create these new materials out of it. And for a company that's a tiny little company looking to actually do something innovative and transformative, that makes a lot of sense for our environment and for our business communities and for empowering a lot of those entrepreneurs who actually want to set themselves up in a way that it makes sense both from a business point of view as well as from an environmental point of view. And I think to me that's the best outcome for a lot of people who are looking to actually deliver on both of those fronts. So to give you a little bit of a summary of what we have been able to achieve with, with micro-recycling, we created something called microsurgery. Okay, so you're probably going, now wait a minute, the last time we checked, you know, this woman does materials, now she's, uh, she's not into, into fixing people. So how does microsurgery come in? What we've actually shown is materials microsurgery allows us to take waste materials. Remember I was telling you that we can take plastics and glass and all of that and create ceramics, ceramics like silicon carbide and nitrides and so on and so forth, depending on the elements you have. But now imagine if you could make those ceramics and if you could embed them on surfaces of metals. So we're talking about metals like steel, you know, your ordinary steel, everyday metals. But now you could actually create a surface that was high performing. Remember, it's really strong. Ceramics are really strong and they've got fantastic properties. You could deliver those properties on the surfaces of steel and you could do that in a way that was affordable because you're still making your steel in the exact same way. What you're doing is you're creating this hybrid layer, but the best part is you're using waste to embed those elements into the surfaces and those reactions that we've been able to control, we've shown again through our publications and a lot of that detail is there in Nature Scientific Reports if anyone's interested in having a look. But what we have been able to show is creating these new surfaces to actually deliver properties to that parent metal that it could not have done on its own. So imagine you could never produce steel of those properties that ceramics has to offer. But now you're creating that layer on the surface of steel. So you're suddenly now creating and working with the realm of what might have been considered impossible into possible. And the best part is it's sustainable and affordable. So the fact that we are now starting to look into what this whole materials microsurgery has meant for us has shown that for this particular industry partner, when we started this work and we said, oh, you know, imagine that you've got, you know, all of this fantastic steel product that you're making, but you could extend the life of these products in a massive way because it's the surface that does a lot of the work, right? It's a surface that wears out and is under attack and is corroded and all the things that we know, you know, we see even on our cars, right? I mean, sometimes when the paint wears off and you've got some corrosion happening on the surface of your car. Imagine now if you could actually start to repair and refurbish your materials 
and you could do it in remote locations, and you could do it simply by using waste resources. You're sort of changing the game because you're no longer thinking, oh, gosh, my surface is now corroded. That's, that steel surface is no longer going to do its job. I've got to throw that away, and I've got to get a whole new product or a part or a component. So for us, this whole sort of notion of what, what we could possibly achieve with this concept of materials microfactory has actually given us hope. And we, interestingly, we've been given hope to our industry partners who've looked at it and have gone, oh, you are literally only starting to scratch the surface. So I don't know if anyone got that bad joke, bad joke, right? <laughs> Scratching the surface. Um, but, you know, I mean, think of it this way. You've got industries getting excited about the fact that we're now creating this whole new hard layer, making those materials that could never do a certain job, give them the ability to do that job. And, and to some extent, the reason why I was sort of inspired to, to call it microsurgery is um, I, I often get inspired by the incredible work that our surgeons do and our medical practitioners. And I thought, you know what? They've got a harder job. They fix people, you know? You think about all the, all the people who get new skins grafted, burns victims, and all of that, and you think about how much is possible in the medical world, and I think we've, we haven't yet scratched the surface in terms of what we can achieve, in terms of how we think about materials and manufacturing. We've sort of put things into neat little boxes. We said, yeah, this is metals, and that's ceramics, and that's plastics, but now we're basically saying, Imagine if you could bring different worlds together for different applications. Yes, you could make your steel here and you could make your glass there and all of that, but you could actually modify, keep your materials and your products running forever and ever. And I think that ability to do that allows us to genuinely start to think about what a true circular economy might in fact look like. So I've said about our industry partners, I thought, I thought I'd spend a moment to just kind of give you a bit of a sense as to who some of them are. The, the company, Mollycorp, located in Newcastle, it is a global company, uh, has got operations um, uh, all over the world. But for them to be able to take something that had never been done before in this whole world of manu manufacturing this particular steel product, and to have that confidence to be able to say, you know what, we're, we're going to give it a go, I think is fantastic. And it's been funded through the ARC, our green manufacturing hub that allows us to recycle. So yes, we started our journey with very we say modest ambition you know it was about recycling our materials but we know that that's never going to be enough we need to think much bigger picture so that's an example of what we're doing with molico what are we doing with nespresso you know company that makes coffee i know i love my coffee but the fact that they've got aluminium coffee pods that are of course you know left over so these are some of the disposables now of course, it can be aluminium or it could be plastic, right? I mean, those are the two common materials. We know very well that in society, in our lives, we use the materials we want. And in fact, the capsule, coffee capsule that's made out of aluminium. Now, people might say, well, you know, why do you use aluminium in the first place? But don't just think of Nespresso's coffee pod as a bad thing. What you can think of it this way, that aluminium has got many, many lives. Remember we were talking about having many, many lives? That aluminium has got many lives, and for a short amount of time, it served its purpose as a coffee capsule. That, if that aluminium can be brought back to life again, then of course, it's not a bad thing. But you know what? I would probably say the same about our mobile phones. Think of it this way, right? I mean, we use it for a couple of years. You can either call it a phone, or I'd like to think about it as a nice little mini mine of different types of elements that happens to be functioning as a phone and, and your data system for a couple of years, and all the elements in there can be brought back to life in a completely different form once we all have stopped using it as a phone, right? So you can think about your products in a completely different way. They serve a certain function and a purpose, and once they're a, get to that end of that particular purpose, it can be reformed again. And that's why that fourth hour reform actually is important to think because we can't just give up on our materials. So Renew IT, that's a company I was telling you about the story about the hard drives. Uh, Tez again, uh, whose video you saw, is, is a company that's collecting a lot of e-waste. Uh, we've got, of course, organizations, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more as I show you a few pictures that are on Mervac, uh, a residential, uh, company that has actually taken on some of the products that we made for the built environment. 
exciting because they've just come back to us and said that they love the, the first display apartment. So the first display apartment that, uh, you know, I was blown away by the fact that they organized, um, you know, an event where people would uh, turn up to Mervac, not only have a look at the beautiful products that we, they've made, uh, they, they were offering me as a package, you know, it's like, okay, come and meet the nerd who did it too, you know. Um, but, but I think to me it was, it was that sort of thing that, that showed how excited people are about recycling. On an early Sunday morning, there were people packing in to not only look at, at the products that we've made, and I've got a few photos, and I'll show you some of those, but the fact that people were so willing to engage. And I think that's the inspiration for me, that people want to be able to do the right thing. The solutions are there, and if we can create solutions and show that it is possible, then people will take it on. So other consumer waste we're looking at, we're looking at waste textiles. So again, I'll show you some products there. And of course, on the right-hand side there, we've got um, e-waste filaments where we're making plastic filaments out of electronic waste plastics. And in fact, the company that we're partnering with there, um, Jar Aerospace, is actually producing uh, parts for aerospace. Again, a small SME in Sydney. And it just goes to show that when an aerospace company is willing to open up its mind and go, you know what? Mm. We actually need to look at this possibility because plastic filament can actually be modified and can be made really, really agile. So from our point of view, it's about, and I'll sort of skip through some of this in the interest of time, the cost of not doing anything. So that's a factory fire in Victoria, Melbourne, where plastics were being stockpiled, right? That's not what you want to happen that we all collect our materials, we assume that the companies that are doing recycling are allowing that stockpile to happen. And of course, you can appreciate the consequences of that um, to, to the community. Uh, uh, so certainly part of the thinking around are moving away from what we call, of course, the linear economy into a more circular economy means that it opens up so many opportunities. It's not just about converting like for like. It's not just saying, let's collect up plastic bottles and we'll convert them into more plastic bottles. All these examples that I've given you actually show that all the way, you know, you can, of course, talk about re reuse and repair and, and all the obvious things that we should be doing. But we get to the point where materials are just too complicated, that they cannot be repaired, in which case you come back, you reform it, you redesign it, and you remake it. But imagine if we could actually start to develop these various sort of concepts. And of course, you deploy different types of circular economy concepts depending on the need and depending upon what you would like to do. So look, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time other than saying that for us now in Australia, we, we are on this journey. Um, the Prime Minister has also announced recently that we are going to be banning export of um, our waste plastics and glass and so on from Australia to overseas destinations, which means our recyclers have to work very closely with consumers. And of course, we want to be inspiring some of that change through the language of science and technology because we know everyone wants to play a part and we are all part of that circular economy. You know, we can't sort of distance ourselves and go, oh, well, you know, well, it's that company's fault. You know, that company that makes that product, it's that company's fault. If we have a capitalist society, we pay money, we buy products, companies operate. It's a simple equation. But we can all collectively be part of the solution together. And that's really where we need to think about how us, as owners of waste materials, our local governments, working with designers, and ultimately end users as end users, we can actually make the choice. And we can say, you know what? If I know that a particular product has got recycled content in it, or if it's been reformed, um, it's just like we as consumers make choices, make ethical decisions about how we choose to spend our money. We need to start to think about the ethical choices that also embrace along with it the more sustainable choices. And I think that's what then encourages a lot of this thinking that the circular economy solution will enable producers and designers to make products. And they'll be more and more inspired if end users actually start to make those choices with their hip pockets. So the circular economy network um, supported through the state government has really allowed us to have that outreach and bring innovative ideas um, to the table and partner with local government. It doesn't matter how small or big a local council is, in a lot of small remote communities, we've seen that people are really excited because the benefit is that it helps them with job creation. 
So look, I'm going to just skip through some of these because I've got a few exciting videos to show you. But the benefit, of course, are obvious. It's ultimately about our people and our planet. But what we can see that this is going to help local economies. This is going to deliver profitability. So this is what uh, micro factories are all about, ultimately making the green materials and also putting them into value-added applications. Do um, one of our micro factories uh, looks something like this? Very exciting. Um, you know, we sort of said, right, got glass walls. Suddenly, got a whole bunch of right to come in and have a look. In. It's great, great, great to be able to share that that passion and that excitement with students. So this, these are the kinds of things we do. You can see waste plastics. Coming from electronics, we've made our plastic filaments in our micro factories. And on the right hand side, of course, you're seeing 3D printing that we're doing for various products. Uh, in this particular case, it's a spectacle frame that we are making. Um, and of course, the list goes on and on. Uh, we've also shown that it's possible to create plastic filaments. And the color in there came from color cartridges. So, you know, when we do our 3D printing, uh, our normal paper printing, and you always have a bit of Color left behind, the toner powder in your cartridges. Well, guess what? That's what that color is. You only need a small amount to bring color to life in those plastic filaments. So all of this ultimately is about micro-recycling, right? Because we know what those toner powders are. Those toner powders are rich in a lot of good minerals. By incorporating those minerals, we bring in the color. We bring in new properties. We're incorporating metallics, for instance, into filaments. Now, suddenly all of these filaments, you might say, that's all well and good. They don't even exist today. So we're now making products where we're incorporating metallic particles to be able to enhance conductivity in these materials. So we're doing things that enable us to print components. And of course, look at the value add that we're creating. Um, that's really what it's about. I showed this slide in the morning, so I won't repeat it. But this actually shows us that another big area that we're working on is with waste textiles. And just some of the products um, to finish off at the end, I want to show you what we're making in the built environment space. Um, you can see on the top left-hand corner, we've taken waste textiles, combined that with waste wood. That's um, one example. You can see, of course, those are good alternatives to basically wood-based products, giving it, of course, beautiful colors as well that come in through textiles. And on the top right-hand corner, of course, glass-based materials. I promised I'd show you what we've got at the moment in the display apartments. So you can see the ceramic tiles that we've made on the right hand side there, the hex tiles that have got waste glass and textiles, that's what's there in the display apartment. And of course on the left hand side, the core fluid came from UNSW campus. So we literally were collecting core fluid. And of course it's interesting how when you start to make things out of core fluid, suddenly it appears from everywhere. Everyone's going. Oh, we've also got a whole truckload of coal fluid. You know, can we have more furniture? That's made? So it's exciting. It's exciting because for, for a lot of people, you know, just having a simple little coffee table in an office or home is just a normal thing. But imagine if we now normalized it and we said that production of some of these everyday items can actually be done with recycled content. Not to mention, we get blown away every time people tell us they want to buy one of these things. And when they tell us what they want to pay for it, really? You know, we we'll pay that much for it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's exciting. So that's, that's the example of the table I was telling you earlier. That's, um, that's a, a, a dining table, which, of course, we thought when we saw these separate tiles, they've got separate tiles on it, so we haven't made it as a monolithic piece. They are separate tiles. We purposely make it modular, because you can imagine if you made it as one big piece, in some instances, can be quite heavy and difficult to get into spaces, uh, a tiny apartment like this one. But the tiles, it's got about 20 tiles on there, and of course, you can imagine we've got a combination of glass and textiles in there. The blue color in there comes from textiles. So now you start to think about the weight in each of these tiles. A few kilos adds up to many, many kilos on the table. You've now, just in a simple product like that, diverted all of that waste that would have ended up in landfills. So um, it is, it is. we'd like, like to call it a green ceramic table. Uh, but uh, it just, I guess, has that sense of the fact that you know, it's green. You can do anything with it. I think we were talking about it today that, you know, let people's imagination go wild. And that's really what we've done. Some more examples of uh, coffee tables that I've, again, got. Um, so the reason why I want to show you these products is, I mean, you can see the simple stools at the back as well. Uh, in the case of this kind of circular table, it also shows that it can be machined. 
and can be manufactured using the normal tools. That's important that, that we are able to fit in into what is possible. So I guess for us, it's been very much about the whole notion that decentralization actually has to happen. We can't afford to take our waste batteries and waste glass and waste plastics and drive them um, all over the country or worse yet, send it across to some other parts of the world. Because of course, remember, in many instances, it could also be a safety hazard. You know, there have been uh, trucks, waste trucks that have caught fire. There have been ships that have, caught, that have caught on fire as a result of transporting waste batteries because these are highly combustible materials. So all of this is really the reason why um, you know, we're talking about the fourth hour of reform. And ultimately, of course, from our perspective, just to finish off, these are all basically sustainable solutions. But I thought I'd um, leave you with uh, the last bit that is really related to our green steel. I started the journey with, of course, telling you a bit about our tires and using that in the process of making steel. So yes, I've given away. It is a pile of tires. But you know, those three people walking down there, they're really brave, but at the same time, a little bit silly, you know, not worried about their safety. Uh, you know, I mean, if that pile of tires caught fire, which it has in many instances, um, you have no way out of it. But that's exactly what this is. In fact, when we started doing green steel, it was a combination of thinking about using waste plastics or tires and so on. And of course, what was fantastic about these tires is they are, they are great in terms of the quality. But just because it's no longer useful as a tire doesn't mean that the product in any way has lost the molecules that made it a good tire. And high performing tire. So this video in the middle shows you what we've actually been able to achieve at the micro level. This has been filmed inside one of our furnaces. But what it does is it's a foam injection technology. We inject these tires inside a steel making furnace, which is what our steel making partners are doing. We've commercialized this technology in Australia as well as in many parts of the world. That allows us to reduce our dependency on coal. All that bubbling action that is taking place is actually showing you that waste tires actually are really, really good alternative. Not only are they allowing us to replace coal, it's actually made the steel makers really happy because it's improved their performance. It's made it so effective for them that um, you can you can literally see when you show them this video and you say to them, I challenge you, give me your traditional coal. And I'll show you a video that is what you're using now, your traditional material, as opposed to injecting rubber tires in the green steel process. And of course, the answer is obvious because you can literally see in this case the high temperature reactions that are taking place that enable these systems to be so efficient. So, we've, as a result of green steel technology, we've diverted millions and millions of tires away from landfill and used that in the process of making steel. Um, a technology that's now embraced in different parts of the world. So ultimately, just to finish off, um, hopefully I have left you with a thought that um, means that micro factories are not no longer just a figment of my imagination. Uh, and yes, I do that sometimes though, uh, talk to myself. But in this instance, the fact that there's been a huge interest from industry and the fact that people are so excited, uh, I think it suffices to say, as we heard today, so many, so many inspiring ways in which we can take technology out to the world and make a real difference to our people. So thank you very much for having me.